Well, just as kind of a playful and fun way to begin, taking uh, characters of fathers from TVs and movies, who would you rather have as your father? Adam Sandler? Or Fred, Fred McMurray from My Three Sons? Chevy Chase from Vacation? Or Ward Cleaver from Leave It to Beaver? We were at a uh, wedding last night. How about Steve Martin in Father of the Bride? Or Gregory Peck in To Kill a Mockingbird? Well, whatever your image of father... There's much in the term that is implicit in God's call for we who are fathers, grandfathers, or perhaps surrogate fathers, that God needs the best out of us. God needs the best. You remember another TV show called Father Knows Best. I just saw a cartoon this week where a dad was with his two children, and they were just rolling on the floor laughing and giggling. And he turned to his wife and he said, all I said was there used to be a TV show called Father Knows Best. (laughs) Do we know best, dads? Not always. But God does call us as fathers and grandfathers to be a protector to our family, a provider, the source of strength to our children and grandchildren, our spouses. God calls for us to seek God's wisdom, to show mercy and patience and love, to walk the talk so that even if those who are born to our family follow after us, there'll be good footsteps to walk in. God needs us to hold our families together with our love. God needs us to be at our best. So when life unfolds in a way that we don't understand, that those who are in our circle of love can trust the heart of their Father, and that we who are the children of God would know that when life unfolds in a way we don't understand, we can trust the heart of our Father. I love the teaching that Jesus gave to His disciples in Matthew 6 that Rachel read to us about how should we pray. When we pray, we say, Our Father. And as Kim said so beautifully to the children, that means... And Lutherans don't always say this so much, do we? But we're family, right? We're family. So we don't say, hey, brother, or hey, sister. Some circles of the Christian church do, but we are family. I remember uh, my grandma. She'd say it in Norwegian, but she would say, God has many strange children. And when you look at me, you're going, yep. (laughs) But I'm your brother in Christ. We're family. But I also like what Luther wrote in his meaning of the first article of the Creed where we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Here's what Luther wrote. I believe that God has created me and all that exists. You remember this? You who grew up Lutheran from your confirmation days? That God has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, all my limbs, my reason, and all my senses. And He still preserves them. God provides me with food and clothing, home and family. He provides me richly and daily, provides all I need to support this body and life. God, my Father, protects me from all danger, guards and preserves me from all evil. All this He does purely out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. Therefore I ought to thank, praise, serve, and obey Him. We have a Father. A 
provider. One who designed us. And now who one who protects us and loves us and wants with all his heart to bless us. So we come back now to this story of the sacrifice of Isaac. And though human sacrifice was not uncommon in that period of biblical history, Yahweh never had asked this of his people. So this is a really unique thing that God asked of Abraham. There are stories that are epic in the memory of history, not just in the Christian church or the Jewish faith, but even known as a powerful story, whether it's Adam and Eve or Noah and the flood or uh, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Daniel in the lion's den. You've got those biblical stories in your head too, don't you? But Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac is one of those epic stories. But before we dive into the story, you've got to remember going back to Genesis 12 that God called Abraham to be the father of his people. He promised to Abraham, I'm going to give you a land I will show you, I will make you a great nation, and I will make you a great name, and I will bless you, and through you, I'll bless the whole world. All the nations of the world will be blessed by you. Well, the tension in the story, you'll remember, is that Sarah, Abram's wife, in her fruitful years, had no children. And at the time the promise came, you remember this? Abraham was 75 and Sarah was 65 years old. So God's saying, there's going to be a child born, the beginning of a great nation, even though you were up in years. And the story leading up to the birth of Isaac is a fantastic story. I encourage you to go home and read it in your Bibles. Because Abraham, who is exalted by us as the great example of faith, did everything wrong in the 25 years before Isaac was finally born. He gave Sarah away to Pharaoh because he was afraid for his life. He went out under the stars and said, hey God, it's not happening. How about my best hired man be the child of promise of that great nation? And God showed him the stars and said, I will give you a son. And then they tried to take matters in their own hands and Sarah said, why don't you go into Hagar and the child born of her will be the child of promise. And that was Ishmael, the beginning of the Arab race fascinating story, isn't it? And then angels appear and Sarah overhears the angels say within a year you'll have a baby. And now it's 25 years later so Sarah is now 90 years old and Abraham is 100. And she laughs at the absurdity that a child would still be born to her. Now that's an important backdrop because now Isaac is born and there's all kinds of reasons why they laugh. They laugh for the joy of the child that was given just as God had promised. They laugh at the absurdity of the irrationality that at 190 they would have a baby. Who do you suppose got up for midnight feedings at that house? And now, after 25 years of waiting, and a few more years as Isaac grows up, God is going to test Abraham. I want you to go and sacrifice your son. Can you imagine how bewildered Abraham would have been? But he obeyed. I find that amazing, don't you? He obeyed. So, in order for this to happen, and did you catch it? He said to the servants, we're going to go off and sacrifice and then we will come back to you. He had to believe 
that either God was going to resurrect the Son after the sacrifice, or that God was going to repeat the miracle of the birth of the child. Because the Father always keeps His promise. The Father always keeps His promise. God was testing Abraham. I remember a man named Everett Shaw in Forest City, Iowa, a dear saint, his faith deeper and richer than mine will ever be, I think. He knows the Scriptures better than any preacher or theologian I've ever met. But he told a story about when he was a boy growing up in his teen years, he worked in a foundry shop. And his job after hours was to sweep up the floor and all the metal scraps on the floor and put them into a basin. I don't know what you call that when you heat it up. Put all that remnant metal into a basin and heat it up to try and save the metal for the next day. And then he said it would, it would boil red hot. And he said, I had to learn to skim the crud, the scum, the stuff that was impure from the top and discard it so that the metal would be pure. The Scripture uses that as a reference to the story of Job. And it talks in 1 Peter about when the trials of life come, that it's like us being tested under fire. So instead of us getting caught up in the mystery of did God have the right to test him or why would he test him in such a weird way or how illogical that was, can we instead say God is always trying to purify our faith to trust Him more fully? To get rid of all those things that compete in the priorities of trusting God above all else. Max Lucado has a quote that I like about times of testing. He says, the circumstances that we ask God to change are often the circumstances God uses to change us. So they're on this journey toward the sacrifice, and even the young boy knows this is weird. So he turns to his dad and said, Hey, Dad, we got the wood, we got the fire, where's the lamb? If you were Dad in that moment, locking eyes with your boy, how would you feel? But he responded in a phrase that has eternal significance of truth for us. The Lord will provide the Lamb. As people of faith, I invite you, when life is a mystery, or when life throws adversity at you, would you trust the heart of the Father like Rory and his daughter, will you just let your life fall back into the arms of your Father? The Lord will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. Of course, we know that the angel stopped Abram. He said, you passed the test. Now I know that your heart is devoted to God above all else. And God provided the lamb. It raises some questions for us. It raised a question for me. I still wrestle with it. What is my Isaac? What is my Isaac? My most cherished possession that if God said, would you give this up? Will you show your love for me by letting me have this? What would that be? You see, within my heart, though I would say I trust my Father in heaven, I'm afraid of what He might ask of me. I'm afraid that He'd ask me to give up something that would feel like ripping my heart out. Can we trust our Father even when it doesn't make sense? Watchman Nee, have you ever heard that name? Watchman Nee was a Chinese churchman, a powerful biblical scholar 
from the 20th century, a preacher and teacher, a prolific writer, who in the last 20 years of his life in China was held by the communist authorities before his life ended in prison. But in one of his books, he writes this. We approach God like little children with open hands begging for gifts. Have you ever begged God for anything? Begging God for gifts, and because God is good, He fills our hands with good things. Life, health, friends, money, success, recognition, challenge, marriage, children, a nice home, a good job, all the things we count on at Thanksgiving when we count our blessings. As little children, we rejoice in what we received, and then listen, and then we compare it with what everyone else has to decide whether we should still be happy. And when our hands are full, God says, My child, I long to have fellowship with you. Will you put your hand in mine? And we say, Ni said, we say, But God, I can't do that because there are things in my hand. It's too hard. I can't put them down. God says, But I'm the one who gave them to you in the first place. God, it's what you ask is too hard. Please don't ask me to give up these things. And God answers quietly, you must. Elizabeth Elliot, another interesting missionary, the wife, by the way, of Jim Elliot, who was martyred by the Akua Indians in the country of Ecuador, who Jim Elliot is the one who said, that man is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Ever heard that quote? So his wife, Elizabeth Elliot, who was also a prolific writer, a radio speaker, a college prof, says, the process of Christian growth is one in which God breaks the idols of our life one by one by one. And how painful it is because by definition we love our idols. They give us strength and hope and meaning. Now here's the tricky part. Most of our idols are perfectly good things. The thing I was holding to so tightly isn't bad or evil. It's something good that has become too important for me. An idol is anything good that becomes too important to you. We tend to associate idols with heathen statues of gold, silver, wood, or stone. That's all an idol is. If that's true, we're in the clear because we don't bow down or do any of those weird rituals. Why would we do something like that? But an idol does not need to be a statue. An idol can be anything good. Our children, for instance, our fame, our athletic prowess, our reputation, our money, our home, our position, our education, our cars, people we know, degrees we've earned, money we made, deals we've closed, Classes we've taught, friends we have, buildings we've built, organizations we've managed, budgets we've balanced, books we've written, songs we sang, records we've made, trips we've took, portfolios we've built, fortunes amassed, our name and lights, all those things that make us feel comfortable and safe and give us status in the world. Elliot writes, could your spouse be your idol? Yes. Your family? Yes. Your children? Yes. Your money? Yes. Your career? Yes. Anything good, if it becomes too important, becomes your idol. God's kindness leads us to a place of sacrifice where we yield Him our dreams, our desires, our plans, our hopes, our dearest friends, even our loved ones, until finally we offer Him back our own lives because He gave them to us in the first place. You know what I realize? I break the first commandment all the time. I have idols. I'm a sinner. 
So the beauty of this story of Abram and Isaac is that the whole of it foreshadows the redemption story of God our Heavenly Father who in love for the world gave His Son Jesus even to die on a cross. Think of the foreshadowing. Your only Son whom you love. A miracle birth. A child of promise. Isaac carried the wood. Jesus dragged the cross. Abram offered up his son willingly. God, our Heavenly Father, in love for you, willingly offered Jesus. Isaac was offered on an altar of wood. Jesus hung on a wooden cross. And a lamb did take the place for Isaac so he didn't have to die. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, took your and my place so we don't have to die nor to fear death and that in the name of Jesus we can say, Abba, God, you're my Father. God is the giver of salvation. Even when I'm a rebel, our Heavenly Father waits for me. So when redemption is complete and when Jesus said it is finished, now the waiting Father opens His arms and opens His heart. The love is still not forced. Do you understand? The Father will never force you. But always patiently He waits with His arms open. Isn't it true that so many live as if they're orphans? So many people go through their whole journey of life living as if they have no father, the source of their life. They live as orphans. And it says in the prodigal son story that in the pig pen, he finally came to his senses. And it was the kindness of his father's heart in how he even treated the servants of the house that convinced the prodigal son he could come home for his father would be waiting we have a Father whose heart is wide open. And the strength of His heart can take care of you in life. When I was a boy, too young to know how to swim, our family went to a lake in Idaho. And there at the lake, in the water, my father took me out way over my head, up to my father's neck. By the way, my father was a farm boy from North Dakota. He had Popeye-like biceps. And I would play a game often when I was a boy. He'd pretend he was a tree, and he could hold his arms out there, and I could hang on him like a branch for as long as I wanted. I had a strong father physically. But when he took me out into the deep, whatever apprehension I had was quelled by the fact that I trusted the heart of my father. I was not afraid. So when you're in the deep, when life throws stuff at you that you don't understand, when life is a mystery, the question of which you can't solve, you can trust the heart of your Father. Father knows best. 